Maybe you've calibrated the E-steps on your 3D printer, but do you know the correct way to calibrate these for X, Y, and Z? As promised, I've started to expand my free 3D printer calibration website. If you haven't seen it, it's linked below and based on positive feedback, it's pretty helpful and maybe you should check it out. But that doesn't mean it can't be improved. So today, thanks to requests from viewers and discussion with patrons, we're adding calibration for X, Y, and Z steps per millimeter. A quick definition, when we talk about steps per millimeter, we're talking about how much the firmware commands the stepper motor to rotate to move that axis one millimeter. Let's say we are printing a functional part that we need to be dimensionally accurate, but when we measure it, it's slightly off. Our aim is to fix this, potentially adjusting the steps per millimeter for X, Y, and Z. This calibration is actually pretty simple, but even so, it's quite often done the wrong way. In this video, we're gonna explain why and go over the correct procedure using a dial gauge. A dial gauge is a precision measuring device, and I haven't personally used this one, but it is the Amazon's choice and it's only $30. You wanna to stick to one with a longer range of motion, for instance, this one's an inch versus half an inch. And if you want to pay the extra, you can also get a magnetic base. But as you'll see in this video, I have a semi-printed alternative that you can make yourself. Alternative tools include a ruler, but it's just not accurate enough. Vernier calipers should hopefully be in your toolkit already. You can kind of use them to measure the movement of your machine. However, they're still the inferior option because the advantage of a dial gauge is twofold. Firstly, it's sprung loaded and returns back to its original zero point. And secondly, it should have a ball bearing on its tip. And that means we can use it for more than we do in this video, like running it along the surface of your bed to determine how warped it is. And we can also put the tip against something round as it rotates to find out exactly how round it is. For this process, we're gonna use it to accurately measure linear movement. So let's get started. Firstly, we need to retrieve the current step per millimeter values from the firmware, and we have a couple of options to do this. The first way in the LCD menu is to come to configuration, advanced settings, steps per millimeter, and all of the values will be listed there. The second is to connect via USB with a terminal program such as Octoprint or Pronterface, send M503, and near the top, you'll have your steps per unit listed as well. The E steps value that you see is something you might already be familiar with. If you've already been through my calibration site, you would see that it has its own tab, which guides you through extruding a set amount of filament very slowly, and then measuring how much of that filament remains before you put your result into the calculator at the bottom of the page, and it will tell you your new E-steps. Our E-steps are a function of the diameter of the hobbed gear and any gearing present in the system, but our X, Y, and Z steps are more of a function of our actual hardware, as well as the electronics in the 3D printer. An excellent resource which I've linked on the tab is the Prusa calculator. If we scroll down to stepper motor section, we can see the parameters that go into calculating the correct steps. For instance, if I were to change to a different size pulley, I can see that my steps would change for that axis. This is a great page because as well as calculating steps for belts, it also has a section for calculating for lead screws on the Z axis. As you can see, the steps per millimeter for X, Y, and Z should be known and they should be accurate, but everything has a tolerance. And also when we add the variation in from the assembly of the machine, we still might need adjustment. Let's start by covering the wrong way and explaining why it's incorrect. You'll remember our example where we were measuring the external dimensions of the printed parts. You might think that you can adjust your steps per millimeter up or down based on how far off the printed part is, but you really shouldn't. And here's why. Let's say we're printing a 20 millimeter calibration cube. And for this demonstration, I'm actually printing three. And for each of them, I've edited the extrusion multiplier, also known as the flow rate. And here they are, from left to right, 80% or under extruded, 96% my normal, and 120%, which should be over extruded. If we compare the two extremes, we can see that the amount of filament that's gone into each individual extrusion differs dramatically. The 80% has gaps in the top, and the 120% has bulges. As you might have guessed, this also affects the external dimensions. As you can see, the overall width of the cube gets bigger the larger the flow rate used for that print. 
Hopefully it's clear to you that we need to remove the printed plastic from our calibration procedure. This example shows that it can affect the dimensional accuracy of the prints without even adjusting our steps per millimeter. Therefore, we're back to our dial gauge and before we proceed, we need a really secure way of mounting it. The first way we need to be able to mount it is directly to the print head of our machine. And if you're lucky, on Thingiverse, there'll already be a printed part to suit your particular dial gauge and your particular printer. I even found one that I had previously designed for the Solidoodle back in 2013. For this video, I designed a simple mount that goes onto an exchange tool plate. This means that when I want to substitute the dial gauge, I can do so in a matter of seconds. You'll also need a freestanding mount for your dial gauge that's independent of the printer. I had a heavy magnetic base with a 12mm rod. These are quite ideal, normally they do nothing but spin the magnet inside and then they'll stick to metal surfaces underneath. Not that I have a metal bench for my printers but it's still a good basis. Whatever you want, it needs to be very rigid. I originally designed this long set of arms that were more adjustable, but as you can see, there was way too much play in the arms. It also had a habit of falling over because the dull gauge stuck out so far from the base. Version 2, which I've uploaded the STLs and step files for on Thingiverse, was still adjustable but a lot more robust, with flex kept to a minimum. When you print this, try and use your most precise printer, for me that's the Prusa Mini because it's got a smaller nozzle fitted. To help reduce play, you can use some adhesive backed foam to take up any slack in the mating surfaces and above all, you should make sure that your dial gauge is quite firm when it's clipped in. We want a really tight fit here. One feature I kept on the updated design was the ability to rotate the dial gauge 90 degrees quickly and easily. We should now be ready to take some precise measurements. Step one is to home the machine, as some firmwares won't let you manually move the axes until you've done this. And it's best to do this with the dial gauge nowhere near the machine to avoid any chance of a collision. We're going to start with the Z axis and that typically means mounting the dial gauge to the print head. We then want to position the dial gauge so one or two millimeters of its travel is taken up before zeroing it. Now our job is to manually move the printer back and forth 10 millimeters at a time and we can do this with the Marlin LCD controls. If our printer has a TFT touchscreen attached we can use that or we can also connect via terminal with Octoprint or Pronterface and use the buttons there. We now complete a series of 10 millimeter movements back and forth using the manual controls. And what we're looking for is the dial gauge to read as close to possible to 10 millimeters. And when we return to the original position, as close to possible to zero. At some stage, you might like to do a double movement and move it 20 millimeters. But just keep in mind the travel of the dial gauge. This one doesn't inch. So anything more than 25 millimeters is going to make it bottom out and possibly damage it. For X and Y, we need our dial gauge mounted on a freestanding system. Again, we compress it a little bit, then zero it and move 10 millimeters at a time. The Y axis can be a little bit tricky because there's not as much surface area for any parts to put the tip of the dial gauge against. It's vital to make sure the dial gauge is perpendicular to whatever is pushing it any angle and your readings are going to be all over the place. Now we have some readings that may or may not be perfect. So the question is, how inaccurate is too inaccurate? Let's say for example that you found most of your measurements out by 0.05 millimeters. To put that into context, that represents an inaccuracy of only half a percent. But is your printer actually responsible for this? Keep in mind that we need to have the dial gauge perpendicular to the object that's moving this shot is exaggerated, but only 5 degrees off represents 0.04 millimeters or most of our error. Also consider that if you're using your hand to hold the dial gauge in place, it's going to wobble just a tiny bit, as you can see here with a variance of 0.02 millimeters. It's important to note that everyone has their own tolerance they're aiming for with the accuracy of their machine. And personally, I'm fine if a 20 millimeter calibration cube actually measures 20.2. But not everyone's the same, so let's continue with some fixes. The first thing you should do is inspect your frame and make sure each axis can move without binding. This Ender 3 V2 was quite stiff on Z, so I lubricated the lead screw, adjusted the V rollers and that freed it up nicely. Another critical area is belt tension and you need to make sure that they're plenty tight. As an experiment for this video, I took all of the tension off and as you might expect, 
the accuracy of the axis really went downhill. Take the time to make sure all of your belts are tight. Also don't forget things like the grub screws in your belt pulleys. If they're loose, everything will slip over time. Let's now assume you've been over the entire machine and everything's accurate, but you still need to adjust your steps per millimeter. This part is actually easy because I've put a calculator within the page. All I need to do is click which target axis we're using, our previous steps per unit as reported by the firmware, how far we wanted to move, and then how far we actually moved. After this, we can click calculate. It'll tell us what our steps should be and what we need to type into the console, followed by M500 to save to EEPROM. And as it says here, you can also input this on the LCD, saving our settings afterwards. Finally, in the event that you've been through this calibration and you have the measured physical movement dialed in perfectly, but your printed parts aren't quite accurate, there is a section at the bottom of the tab with some suggestions on how you can fix this. For instance, using horizontal expansion built into the slicer. That's it from me. If you're going to try this out, let me know in the comments. Same goes for if you've got any suggestions that I can add to the page. Thank you so much for watching and until next time, happy calibrating your 3D printer. G'day, it's Michael again. If you like the video, then please click like. If you want to see more content like this in future, click subscribe and make sure you click on the bell to receive every notification. If you really want to support the channel and see exclusive content, become a patron. Visit my Patreon page. See you next time.